I'm going to be describing for you today our programs at Columbia and um, to give a rationale for our mission. We have been working to uh, identify pathogens and triggers for, for ME-CFS for, for quite some time. Um, and I just want, before I begin, I wanted to, uh, is there's no pointer here? Oh, here's a pointer. Okay. I want to just thank our, uh, our funders who have been really fortunate have uh, not only NIH funding, this doesn't work though. It doesn't work very well. Or maybe you have to hold it. Okay. Yeah, NIH funding um, uh, from Edward e Evans Foundation, uh, from Cimarron, Cimarron Research, and the Chronic Fatigue Initiative, in addition to some really key crowdfunding uh, uh, fun funds from the Microbe Discovery Project. Okay. So we know that there have been many instances of clusters of ME as well as implication through other means of viruses, bacteria, and perhaps other types of infectious uh, agents. However, these are agents that have been implicated in a wide range of brain disorders, not just ME. And so the question becomes, first of all, how do you make the tie to any particular agent for, with ME? And then how do you explain if there are multiple agents that can cause similar types of uh, symptom uh, complexes or that can cause a, a broad array of dysfunction, how do you actually tie that together and make sense of it in terms of describing uh, the, the disorder, finding a way to diagnose it more efficiently, and even more importantly, perhaps, identifying ways to intervene or prevent? There's been increasing focus as well, as you've heard already today uh, by many of the prior speakers, uh, microbiome and gastrointestinal uh, types of bacteria. And gastrointestinal comorbidity is very common in many brain conditions. Probably um, it, may, it may represent only a subset of individuals with, with ME, but certainly there are uh, aspects, uh, a subset of ME that have uh, irritable bowel syndrome or other types of manifestations of gastrointestinal dysfunction. And we also know that m in most of these conditions where gastrointestinal comorbidity exists, there's often a sleep disturbance. And this, we think, is ultimately will provide something that will help us to understand the mechanisms of unrefreshing sleep and uh, other aspects of sleep uh, disturbance and circadian rhythm disturbances in uh, a range of disorders, including ME. The microbiota are complex. They're all over our bodies. We tend to focus only on those that are in our intestinal tracts, but we have them on our skin, we have them in our eye, we have them you know, all, throughout, uh, all throughout the body. And they have multiple roles in normal regulation as well as in dysfunction. And I always want to emphasize that, you know, bacteria can be our friends. Uh, they are our friends. They do a lot of our digestive function. They do many key activities that we don't perform at all ourselves or don't perform well ourselves uh, through our own host metabolism. And we know that if you didn't deprive an animal as it's developing of, uh, of the normal gut microbiota, you have great derangement both in the structures of the brain as well as in the behavior, in, the dis in disorganized uh, behavior. But many things can disrupt the uh, microbiota development and beginning even in, uh, in a, a pregnancy. And we know that individuals who are born by vaginal delivery have a different microbiota than those who are born by cesarean section, causing some to actually now take the vaginal microbiota and smear it all over uh, uh, the newborn in, in the event of a C-section. We don't know yet what the importance is uh, and whether that's safe to do, but we um, do know that the uh, normal vaginal uh, microbiome is uh, sort of seeds the intestinal uh, uh, of, uh, intestinal tract of the newborn and is key in developing a normal 
metabolism and normal function in, in, that, in that newborn. Many things can thereby disrupt it, um, nutritional factors as well as environmental factors, including organophosphate uh, pes pesticides and other toxicants, uh, but also infectious agents and viral agents uh, can also disrupt the bacterial uh, communities that we uh, rely on so heavily. Uh, as, and of course, antibiotics and other drugs. And there are probably a whole host of other factors that affect the uh, function of microbiota that cause epigenetic changes in the microbiota themselves. So we don't know yet the extent to which this occurs, but there, are some ev there is some evidence in animal models that stress in an individual will cause epigenetic changes on the bacteria to occur, and then that carries forward and alters the function of the, uh, of the genes that are expressed in those bacteria going forward. So uh, this, this happens throughout a lifetime. It's key in affecting a particular neurotransmitter called serotonin that has multiple effects on vital functions that can be quite disrupted in, uh, in, in ME, including sleep, sex drive, uh, motivation, ability to pay attention, and uh, a, a, a wide array of other issues. So what is this gut-brain axis? We know that there are aspects in the microbiota that affect uh, the functioning of the cells lining the epithelium. Uh, the, the immune cells actually get their directions. They go to school uh, through the bacterial signals uh, there, uh, your immunoglobulin A. Uh, Producing plasma cells are trafficking through, 80% of them are trafficking through and getting uh, their, their lessons and, and their, uh, their marching orders from, uh, from the molecules that they uh, uh, see as they go back into, uh, in, into the blood. And there are molecules that are uh, brought into the blood uh, both by the bacteria as well as what's induced in the host by those bacteria, including key neurotransmitters that are involved. You heard a little bit about dopamine. We just talked a little bit about serotonin. But also short-chain fatty acids, uh, which we'll describe a, a, little bit, uh, it, a little bit later, affecting autoimmunity and infl inflammation. Another key aspect is the vagus nerve. It is in control of t uh, a particular cytokine called t TNF-alpha. And it's in, important in what's called the inflammatory reflex, uh, best described by Kevin Tracy, which uh, is, is really key that you have this uh, vagal nerve uh, afferent going into the brain. And then there are actually signals that go back down into the intestine to shut off the, and, or go back into the spleen, it shuts off the uh, immune uh, activation. So you get the pro-inflammatory effect and then you have this shutdown. So there's a way to turn it off so it's not continually feeding forward. If you're looking at the aspects of metabolism, uh, the gut me metabolome uh, component is played out here. Uh, you have uh, effects on a, a variety of vital uh, biochemical uh, reactions, including the TCA uh, cycle and the effects on uh, glutamine uh, within the intestinal epithelial cell. And then these will go into the blood um, at, at, with various products that then have additional effects, and that can thereby go to the brain and cause, uh, and, and, uh, and cause either healthy effects or, or uh, disrupt normal brain function. Similarly, under eubiosis, this is the natural commensal bacteria, a healthy uh, scenario. You see, here you see your IgA producing uh, plasma cells, um, and they're conditioned again by all of these commensal bacteria. These are producing immune signals, uh, cytokine balance that uh, allows you to respond to the bad actors and then shut down the response when the bad actors have been contained. And you have also in dysbiosis have disruption of this leading to uh, uncontain uncontained inflammation and, uh, and perhaps a, a increase in autoimmunity. There are signals, there, there are receptors in, in the intestine that read uh, viruses, uh, poly-IC is sort of a generic, a double-stranded RNA, TOL3 receptor, uh, it reads the signal from a variety of viruses. These are part of what's called the pathogen-associated molecular patterns. They're meant to be broadly 
uh, receptive and, and active uh, upon seeing uh, a number of danger signals. TOL4 is typically for uh, bacterial signals, you know, like uh, that, as in uh, LPS. And then you have downstream within the cell a variety of, of responses. And we also know that there can be activation uh, more directly by uh, toxicants that then downstream will lead to immune disruption within the cell. How does this relate to, to ME? Well, certain aspects are, are, are clear. Things like fever production are a result of uh, a variety of uh, challenges. Here, example, uh, example is with a viral challenge. Uh, activating the TOL3 receptor with a variety of uh, cytokine, pro inflammatory cytokines, including IL 1 beta, which used to be called the endogenous uh, pyrogen or fire starter in the days before interleukins had numbers, which was when I started in this business. Um, PGE2, and these have an effect in the hypothalamus, the, the medium preoptic nucleus, to uh, alter uh, the, uh, a, a variety of physiologic responses and, uh, that lead to the production of fever. We also know that there can be other effects of cytokines. So these pro inflammatory cytokines can actually gain access to the brain through the circum, uh, circumventricular organs where there is no blood brain barrier, or through active transport, or through some type of disruption of the blood brain barrier, and then can alter sympathetic uh, activity and alter the balance of the autonomic nervous system and lead to uh, perhaps things like POTS, uh, orthostatic uh, uh, tachycardia, and other, and other effects. We've been looking to try to answer some of these uh, puzzles and to try to piece together how the microbiome, other pathogens, the immune system, and the metabolome may, may ultimately affect the brain. And starting with key well-characterized uh, subject pools is really, uh, and their specimens is really uh, a, a very important part of that. We have, we've been privileged to have uh, uh, funding for a, a number of studies, uh, including the first study, which was focused on uh, XMRV, Chronic Fatigue Initiative Study, which now is complete but has database, clinical database and samples, uh, including stool samples for microbiome studies from a, a, a follow-up study from the main cohort. Uh, work with uh, Dr. Montoya's samples at Stanford, and then also um, have uh, the current study, which is funded by NINDS. I must say it's a one-year study. It's only for collection of samples and, uh, and clinical data. Uh, but 125 cases, 125 controls, and this has really been critically supported also by the micro uh, discovery project because the one-year NIH funding only extended so far wouldn't have covered the whole year. Uh, and a variety of other studies, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Our approach has been one sort of called a stage strategy. We look at the low-hanging fruit first, using very uh, targeted techniques, trying to find pathogens that we know exist, and we know their you know, sequence, and we can identify them, identify them through molecular techniques. Newest on the platter is the vercap -seq vert This is a molecular technique that is, uh, which, was, which we published about last year, that can detect every vertebrate virus that has been deposited, where its sequence has been deposited in GenBank. And we have, uh, so it's very, very powerful, highly sensitive, and some, for some viruses it's actually more sensitive than PCR. Um, but also high throughput sequencing, uh, and then also our studies for bacteria, microbiome, which is the, uh, the fungi, and then uh, virome. These are the agents that we looked at first through MassTag PCR, um, and uh, th this is what our clinician working groups, you know, and the literature said, maybe look here. Um, we have to look further. Um, so we're looking further. And another way to look further to try to understand what might be uh, causing a disease from an infectious disease standpoint when you have at least six months before you get to look um, at the blood specimens by, given the way the diagnostic criteria are in this disorder, um, and we're using uh, uh, techniques at the RNA level, DNA level, genetic and epigenetic, but also uh, looking at plasma, protein level, uh, doing immune oxidative stress markers, uh, immune pro uh, profiling for autoantibodies and a pathogen antibodies through a new technique, uh, which is a phage approach, different than the, the, you know, this is using phages to tell us what antibodies are present, which tells us over time what infectious agents people have, have seen, and then also proteomics and metabolomics. We're also using a new uh, exercise challenge test. Sometimes when you look at the basal level, you look at the baseline at somebody, you may not be able to tell 
what they actually would have a problem with in the event that they are stressed in some way. So what we're doing here is we're, we're doing before and after, after an exercise challenge test uh, with uh, Dan Peterson's group seeing the, seeing the patients. Uh, this is just getting uh, off the ground uh, soon. Um, and we, uh, it goes, the, the blood goes into a special little tube and you actually can do a little dynamic challenge to the blood cells to see what their capacity is or isn't in a little test tube that is uh, the same as the uh, blood drawing chamber. We are interested in looking not only at the immune response and the cytokine uh, responses uh, for their ability to tell us what infectious agents have been there, but also perhaps to tell us something about the normal uh, microbiota gone bad. So how have the how has the gut microbiome perhaps changed? And we we're interested in this because there are multiple uh, la multiple layers of the uh, intestine that have the capacity to be disrupted by the changes in metabolites through a disrupted uh, uh, microbiome. So some of these. Uh, bacteria can produce more luminal gases. Some of them may uh, produce certain types of LPS, and different LPS leads to different responses, but some lead to more like a diarrhea, an increased gastrointestinal motility through that TOL4 uh, pathogen-associated molecular pattern receptor. Um, tryptamine affecting serotonin uh, re uh, effects, as well as effects through short-chain fatty acids. So we also know that these products somehow uh, are related to the modulation of autoimmunity uh, by the patterns of uh, microbes that are present. And in animal models, we know that there are, uh, can be actually changes. This is a mouse model of multiple sclerosis that you can actually completely, uh, you can completely change the, uh, and prevent disease by altering the microbiome. Whereas uh, in other, in other uh, scenarios, you may actually uh, have uh, suppression of disease, and in other cases, you might have increased disease as, uh, as here. So the genetics and the microbiome and uh, the, probably the timing in which you introduce these can have an effect. One of the key products of, of bacteria that uh, have been showing, us to, uh, showing themselves to be uh, quite interesting are the short-chain fatty acids. And uh, butyrate-producing bacteria uh, seem to, uh, when they produce more butyrate, as in a control individual, they uh, are uh, typically protective against disorders like type 1 diabetes, where you have lower levels of butyrate. And uh, in, in contrast, other short-chain fatty acids, propionate, acetate, succinate, are more likely to lead to autoimmunity. So the skew of your microbiome may actually make it more likely that one develops an autoimmune scenario. A lot of this action occurs in a part of the intestine called the terminal ileum, a highly metabolically active uh, area where there are glutamate receptors. There's changes in redox. Glutathione, which is a protective antioxidant, um, can be skewed by the microflora products as well as dietary products that, are, uh, uh, that, that may be taken in. And there are changes in epigenetics. All of the receptors that are in that area are susceptible to the uh, possibility through these changes in redox and also changes in the inflammatory cells through the bacterial products to the development of uh, autoantibodies against those receptors, but also against other products that are exposed uh, in the, in the ter terminal ileum. And typically, the microbiome changes uh, that we associate with intestinal inflammation are associated with an increase in the uh, IL-17 producing cells, known as the Th17 cells, are, and a drop in the T regulatory cells. Then this also can uh, drive towards autoimmunity. In one example, we've seen very interesting effects. So how, how can this relate perhaps to behavior? You know, we're going, okay, we have microbiome, we have metabolites, we have redox and oxidative stress. You know, how does this relate to actually a behavioral effect and something that might actually play a role in ME? And I have a very interesting example with a change in um, a certain commensal gut bacteria. Uh, it's an E. coli, but one of the good ones. Um, and it has a heat shock protein called CLPPB. Uh, and that actually is a mimic of uh, alpha uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone, not the receptor, but the hormone itself. And uh, in eating disorder patients uh, who often have a lot of anxiety as well, ha they've been shown to have antibodies that are cross-reactive with alpha MSH as well as with this heat shock protein. 
and uh, in animal models that induces that, that uh, E. coli uh, with that heat shock protein leads to autoantibodies similar to the ones seen in the eating disorder patients. Uh, it disrupts signaling through the melanocortin receptor 4 uh, pathway and, and also uh, reduces food intake and, and anxiety. So, and these are hypothalamic, uh, you know, uh, functions, these are very core vegetative uh, functions that are regulated in large part by a neuro the neurotransmitter serotonin. We've been using a variety of techniques, as I said, you know, at di different levels. And at our plasma level, we were able to identify that there were differences in immune signatures uh, in, in MECFS and that there may be a course of the disease over time. I emphasize that we've only done cross-sectional analyses up until now, so we don't have any, uh, any longitudinal data to present yet. Uh, so we don't know within a subject how, whether, you know, how this happens. People may have their own time course. But by and large, we use short defined as three years or less, and we found that there was an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-1 beta, IL-17A, interferon gamma, and the short. And uh, in the long subjects, they were often were lower than the, the controls and lower than the, uh, uh, the short duration subjects. So we want to understand this better and are in the process that one-year longitudinal study will allow us to look at the course of cytokines within individuals along with their microbiome changes throughout the course of a year. We've also found signatures in spinal fluid. This was a study which was all subjects that were, uh, you know, uh, more long duration subjects, and they had a very different pattern in the central nervous system compartment right in the spinal fluid. And the, here, the same cytokines, IL-1 beta, instead of being increased in ME, they were actually decreased. And IL-6 was nearly undetectable in, uh, in that scenario. So the different compartments play a different role. We don't understand yet all of that regulation or whether it is merely related to the duration of illness. And our studies are, are, are looking at that further and trying to tie it back to the microbiota. One of the key missing pieces in the middle is, uh, are the, is the metabolome um, that also shapes the immune system. This is a, this pathway called the tryptophan degradation pathway or the kynurenin pathway occurs in brain, but it also occurs in white blood cells. And when it occurs in a white blood cell, when you shift tryptophan down this way, instead of going towards serotonin synthesis and the building of melatonin, your circadian rhythm regulator, which is also one of a very potent immunopotentiating agent, if you're shifting it down this way, you are it, within a white blood cell, you're shifting it to an autoimmune cell. You create a Th2 shift that is more likely to participate in autoimmune, autoimmunity enhancing and autoantibody producing activities. Um, and a variety of micro, uh, mi microbes participate in this, project, uh, this process and can make it more likely that you trigger through this, these, path, these various uh, cytokines and through glucocorticoids and oxidative stress that you trigger them uh, down, down this way. So we're trying to look for these signals using our uh, microbial detection techniques. The pathway is very, very complex. We, you know, uh, have many, many uh, different aspects of it. And I just want to emphasize that it's a normal process, too. If you don't have this process, you don't have memory systems working. If it's not working in your, in your uh, white blood cells, you're, uh, ha you know, you you're don't have normal balance. So it's all a matter of tightly regulated function. And you also, the end, although this is a neurotoxic compound, quinolinic acid, you, if you don't have quinolinic acid, you don't have NAD+. Plus. You don't have NAD+, plus, you don't have any energy. So these processes are really ones where it shouldn't be all or none, but it's really, we, un we must understand the regulation of these processes and understand how to boost the resiliency of these processes so that they can remain well balanced after the stresses and, you know, the, the slings and arrows of everyday existence. Um, we were looking closely at the metabolites. This is, these are not data that are uh, only in ME. These are actually in our entire population, cases and controls together. But we found that when serotonin was not detectable, you actually had an increase in all of the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are responsible for triggering the tryptophan degradation pathway, which takes tryptophan away from serotonin synthesis and making it more likely 
you know, that serotonin will be not detectable. So these things are making sense. We're trying to piece all these parts together, look at the correlations, see if they make sense, and then try to make uh, additional investments. And so, and, and similarly, interferon gamma, which is a potent uh, inducer of the tryptophan degradation pathway, uh, and it, it, the cytokines associated with, and the chemokines associated with it are also increased when serotonin is not detectable. We're looking now within cases and controls to see how those systems are regulated differently. In conclusion, really, I want to talk about really how we put this together with autoimmunity. You know, we started, you know, back in the, the, the you know, the turn of the last century, thinking about one agent, one disease and that it would always be specific and that you could just stick it into an animal and see the result. We know it's not that simple. First of all, there's adaptive immune responses under genetic controls as well as developmental controls uh, and as that can be affected by cofactors, even, you know, uh, or, you know organic pesticides and other, and other uh, toxicants, heavy metals as well. And we also know that we can pick up things that may not have a role in disease. Molecular markers are such that we may have something that's part of a virome and it may not have caused an infection. So we need to be careful. We can apply these to thinking about autoantibodies as well, because autoantibodies are ubiquitous, even against brain. Uh, you know, a large portion of us in, who are feeling or who are feeling well and don't have disease have autoantibodies that are targeting brain components, and we're just sitting here and there's no problem. Why is that? Why aren't they pathogenic? in everyone if they exist. So we, we try to understand that. And so uh, Witebski uh, uh, was uh, trying to uh, use the same sort of model to think about one autoantibody, one disease. Again, not likely to be that simple a scenario. Um, and we also have to think about other aspects of autoimmunity uh, through T cells, not just the B cell product of an uh, autoantibody. And then there are many, many other aspects, including the fact that many of the consequences of some of these pathogenic effects could happen decades later. We know, we, we've just published on maternal cytokines during pregnancy and the risk of major depression in the offspring 50 years later. And it is a very potent effect and it's a sex-dependent one. So we, we need to understand all of those things better. Many aspects of autoimmunity, I think that, you know, it, my, uh, my sense is that autoimmunity is going to be important in ME, what portion of the population with ME, it's a heterogeneous disorder, what portion it will uh, affect I, is unclear, but we need to answer m these questions. Who's, who's susceptible? What are the targets? Uh, what, you know, the, is, is the timing important to the disease expression? Where is the, uh, where is the action happening? Uh, if it's only, if it's uh, kept from going into the brain because of a nice, tight blood-brain barrier, um, is that, you know, something that we could work on to boost the blood-brain barrier so that uh, brain uh, effects may, may not uh, uh, have to occur? Um, we also know that there's natural autoantibodies that are helpful for us, IgM natural antibodies. Um, then, you know, we would need to know more about, about those and their participation and to understand most of, many of these other effects. In addition, we now add in the microbiome and how that shapes autoimmunity. And again, you know, you can get into the uh, central nervous system through circumventricular organs because uh, there are parts of uh, the brain that are not protected. In other cases, you have to think about the blood-brain barrier. Just, and to, to close, I want to think about the future. Where do we go with this? Does it have implications for only explaining disease, or does it have implications for intervention? I want to be very cautious here. I'm not saying that uh, we uh, have a cure here or something that you should go out to your local uh, uh, pharmacy to, you know, to, to try to get or health food store. but. Uh, in, uh, in, a, in a rat model, um, you can uh, prevent a classical autoimmune disease in diabetes-prone rats by giving this lactobacillus johnsony. And, and uh, what we see is that it actually increases serotonin uh, in the ileum as well as in the serum. So it has this very positive effect, and it's working through that tryptophan uh, by reducing the act activation of that tryptophan degradation pathway. 
There's been some studies in humans, again, nothing to go out and, you know, and, and to, to go buy, although this came from Danone, France. Um, it's a fermented milk product, and what they found was actually in a brain imaging study, it showed that there was, uh, looking at emotional attention in these uh, individuals with tw twice a day, four week uh, intervention, there was, a, there was an effect that, uh, that was independent of changes in the gut microbiome, at least so far as they looked. They didn't look deeply enough from a sequencing perspective, uh, but you know, at least uh, at the major level, there were not really uh, big changes, but there were changes in, um, uh, in brain active uh, metabolites. So, uh, and we, they were able to demonstrate using functional brain imaging that there were changes in the sensation transmitting areas of the brain, for the areas that transmit for pain, touch, and stretch as well as emotional processing. So, and those were correlated with the improvement in the emotional response. So, we have a lot to answer yet. We also have a lot to perhaps reinterpret. This is one of my favorite quotes, and we heard Einstein throughout the research conferences as, as, as well. Um, and here, Einstein was approached, and students very upset, you know, the questions are the same as last year. How is that? And he said, true. But this year, all the answers are different. And we have to keep challenging ourselves to, you know, to go back and to, uh, to ensure that we, have, uh, that we have the right framework for answering the questions. We have to be humble in our limitations of our techniques um, and to, uh, I think, also work together to answer this important puzzle. And this doesn't happen without a village. So I'm um, thankful to all the people we have uh, an opportunity to work with, including our, our clinician teams, as well as uh, the, the teams and in our, in our funding agencies. Thanks. Adi, thank you very much. <laughs> OK, it's open to you now. A few questions, please. Yes, there's one up there, just sir. Uh, how important do you think the lymphatic system is in spreading um, pathogens to the brain? The lymphatic system? Yeah, last yeah. year there was uh, some uh, a lymphatic system found to penetrate into the brain. Well, I think we, we know now that there's a drainage system for lymphatics too, for, you know, from, uh, from, from the brain, from uh, Kip, Jonathan Kipnis's uh, recent work, although he might not have been the first to describe it, but in any case, um, I, I think that we there's a lot that we don't, uh, and that is perhaps an example of something that you know even if he wasn't the first, even if Kipnis wasn't the first to discover it, um, it's important that we keep going back and remind ourselves, you know, uh, what uh, what the possibilities may be. <clears throat> We don't know enough, really, about uh, the controls about uh, for, uh, for lymphatic drainage uh, we, uh, to uh, and, and flow to be able to you know to understand that. I think we are not. Uh, we we also don't um, know enough about the regulation of uh, vascular flow, neurovascular flow. Um, we, we've discovered certain things, you know, uh, it, that don't have good explanation. So, for example, we know that when you have animal models and you inject an antibody in the periphery, if you, depending on what you give to break the blood-brain barrier, if you give epinephrine, it goes to the stress response circuitry, the amygdala. If you give LPS from E. coli, you get breach of the blood-brain barrier, and those, an those antibodies go more selectively to hippocampus. Um, if you give mycobacteria, such as it, which is in Freund's adjuvant, you know, which is another sort of uh, blood-brain barrier breaching agent, um, it tends to go to hippocampus and cerebellum, as well as striatum. And so we don't understand yet how, you know, how the neurovasculature changes, let alone how we might uh, alter lymphatic flow, but I think it, it, it's an important area to pursue. Well, looking at this as a, a partially a historian, I'm reflecting on the Frawley work in between 1955 forward in England and thinking of people like 
John Richardson and Melvin Ra Ramsey, who were hypothesizing that, based on some evidence, that this disease had a close connection to enterovirus, especially in outbreaks, Coxsackie B, and so on. And I'm wondering what kind of bridge of thought might possibly be built between that very traditional, very single cause kind of model, which may yet be true since we've had some evidence through Chia, and the very complex model that we're seeing here. Is there a bridge? Well, I, I my, my, the thread that I pull that, that, that kind of gives me clarity of, of, of a framework with which to approach this is one that is focused on autoimmunity. One of the major causes of autoimmunity is a, an exposure to, uh, to an infectious agent. I mean, the mo most classical one that we know the most about is not vir viral, but rather bacterial, let's say strep, you know, strep infection and the, all the strep-related autoimmune you know, uh, responses, the glomerular nephr nephropathy, as well as rheumatic fever, and you know this behavioral syndrome with obsessive compulsive disorder known as PANDAS. And uh, so we we know that one of the commonalities can be that it's not the direct effect of the infection necessarily, and it's not necessarily it's direct effects on 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 a cell, um, and, but uh, you know, which it can still have those effects, but rather effects that cause a uh, disruption of antigen presentation that allows for a break in tolerance to a self-antigen, right? And that then you have cross-reactive effect where the autoantibody can then go after something to which it should be tolerant but then has become not tolerant, you know, to anymore and, and is binding to that and that shares some sequence similarity uh, with the pathogen be it virus, be it bacterial, you know, or, or other. So um, that's the thread that makes sense to me. There are obviously many other types of, uh, you know, uh, things that one can think of. One can be thinking about infection causing an innate immune response that, uh, you know, that uh, has certain aspects. And that actually may be necessary for the autoantibodies to get into brain. What breaches the blood-brain barrier can also, you know, it's epinephrine will do it, bacterial products will do it, but also cytokines will do it. So those are part of the response, kind of generically, to many types of infections. So um, maybe it shouldn't be just either or. My my bet in terms of where we can do the most good is probably through uh, addressing and understanding the autoimmune, the, what we call disruption of the adaptive immune arm. And, uh, and we may be able to change it through something as easy as a probiotic or you know, a, a change in the, uh, in the microbiota to alter that, uh, that process. Okay. Thanks very much, Maddie, indeed. Thank you.